Welcome and thank you for attending the ANA Innovation National Nurses Month event. Today, we celebrate numerous facets of nursing and nursing innovation as we listen in on a conversation with critically acclaimed journalist and author Sarah De Gregorio, along with four other nurse innovators, including our See You Now podcast host. You'll be able to access this content via YouTube and on our podcast platforms after the event. In the meantime, connect with each other, share your comments, and submit your questions for Sarah and our nurse innovators via the Q&A feature. At the end of the conversation, we'll reconnect with our speakers to answer your questions in person. Nurses are our nation's most valuable healthcare resource. Thank you for everything that you do, and happy National Nurses Month. And now, to begin our program, with our See You Now podcast host, I introduce you to Shauna Butler. Every year, May 12th marks International Nurses Day. It's a moment for recognition for the 27 million women and men who make up the global nursing and midwifery workforce, half of the global health workforce. In 2023, Our Nurses, Our Future is the global campaign focused on what's required to address the global health challenges and improve global health for all, including the World Health Organization's projection that the world is going to need at least an additional 9 million nurses and midwives by the year 2030. So why May 12th? It's the birth anniversary of the world's best known nurse, Florence Nightingale, and the story of a nurse and nursing's power to change our world. But there are so many nurses and so many stories that the world doesn't know. Ones that have also had profound advances in health, safety, and the well-being for generations of people across the world. Fortunately, that's about to change with the release of an important new book that's a sweeping cultural and political history of nursing from the Stone Age to the present, written by journalist and critically acclaimed author Sarah De Gregorio, who I am delighted to be speaking with today. Taking care, the story of nursing and its power to change our world pays homage to the profession and makes an urgent call for change. So Sarah, welcome and congratulations. This is so exciting. Thank you for having me today. I'm so pleased to be here. It's an honor for me. Well, how are you feeling? I mean, this is like birthing another baby. It happens, you know, um, over such a long period of time, that sort of gestation and Um, really thinking um, and reading and interviewing. Um, The process of putting together a book is something that I really love. Um, And it is something that you do all by yourself. It's just something that I'm very grateful to be able to do. I remember back in 2020 when we first met, and I remember our conversation distinctly. And it was like, oh my gosh, here is this person who really understands nursing. And um, the story of nursing, it's complicated. It's, um, it's woven into war, plague, religion, the economy, racism, social justice movements, and all of our lives. You've really chronicled the lives of the nurses that we should know, those past, those present, those who are actively improving lives and communities across the world, um, often invisibly, um, stories that, that people don't know. And I have to say, you've done the, the near impossible. You know, you've taken your own personal experiences but you've, and you've woven them into this very well-documented, very well-researched book on the profession of nursing. Um, I read it, the book, the whole book in one night, couldn't put it down. And just reading the introduction, you've really overcome the outdated, the incomplete, and frankly, the really lazy tropes that are typically and narrowly portraying nurses. Um, you know, society has, I heard you say this, and I've adopted this, that society has such an impoverished understanding of nursing. And this work does a, such a great job of enriching and nourishing. Why does the world need this book? Thank you for saying all that. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm glad that it spoke to you. I think the world needs this book because as long as the general public does have an impoverished understanding of nursing, as long as we don't, um, as long as we underestimate the insight and the expertise of nurses, we are going to continue to struggle to find well-being. And I I really believe that. And so um, when when I set about to write this book, 
um, there was so much that I didn't know. There was so much that I didn't know. And so the book is really an honest journey in terms of me learning about, you know, the vast potential of nursing, the vast scope of nursing. Um, and that I think is one of the strengths of journalists and um, in particular journalists who can come to a, a topic with some personal experience because, um, you know, I'm, I'm a person who has needed care. My family has needed care. Uh, and I had questions, so many questions. And I think so many people feel very lost when they need health care. Um, and so the book really was my process of trying to understand what is, what is nursing? What is this vast scope of nursing? And how, you know, what are we leaving on the table as a society when we don't elevate nursing knowledge and expertise? That is a part of the story that gets left off. People know nurses as caring. They know right. them as trustworthy. They know them as hardworking, but they don't know the science. Um, they don't know the practice. They don't know the research behind um, so much of, of care. What they experience is really good care, but that is, uh, that is grounded in the research and the evidence and um, a lot of, a lot of history, a lot of um, great research and evidence on that. You mentioned that you have been navigating the healthcare system all your life. You were born prematurely? That's right. I was born prematurely um, at around 32 weeks. So I, um, although of course I don't remember that, um, that's how I started my life in a NICU. Um, and both of my parents were quite ill when I was young. I'm an only child. Um, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was six. Um, my father struggled with substance use disorder and Crohn's disease, um, all his life. And both of my parents died relatively young. So I really did grow up, um, needing to navigate the American healthcare system and feeling very lost in that feeling really lost, having lots and lots of questions. Um, and you know, the way I think about it now, that sort of experience of wanting my most beloved people to get the care that they needed, um, really felt like being in a labyrinth and it felt like being kind of like a supplicant, like being like, you know, just trying so hard to get this physician to talk to that physician, trying to make sure the pharmacy got the right prescription. Um, and, you know, I think that's a lot of people's experiences that people feel really, really lost in a very fragmented healthcare system that we have. And a lot of my questions as a journalist come out of those experiences, you know, whether they, whether I foreground them or not, um, when I'm writing, I do know what it's like to need care um, and to struggle to get it. And I also know what it's like when you do get care that you need, when someone sees you and hears you and is able to help you. Um, it's profound. It's really profound. And that's really where this book came from for me. I was thinking about, I wanted to write about connection in healthcare. And my editor said, well, that it's a nice idea. Like you need to do a little more digging on that because, you know, every time we talk about, um, you know, the ways that healthcare is failing, we know, and nurses know better than anybody else, all of the ways that, that healthcare is really failing to provide our communities with well-being. But I didn't, you know, I also wanted to provide, um, stories about hope and stories, because we know that that's not the whole story, that there are people in the healthcare system who are absolutely doing the most incredible work. And I wanted to get there. There were these moments of clarity for me growing up and moments of clarity when I had my, my daughter was also born prematurely at 28 weeks. Um, and nobody loves a nurse better than a NICU mom. I can tell you that, right? Like nobody. Either that or somebody who's in oncology, like we all have our favorite. Yeah stories of, yeah. of nurses who've been there. And what I realized was that, you know, these moments of clarity for me and these moments of feeling seen and heard and understood as a person, as a daughter, as a mother, um, these moments of clarity and, and help often came from nurses, almost invariably. I mean, really almost invariably. And I, what I realized was that that wasn't a coincidence. And that was sort of where I wanted to start. I was like, oh, because nurses are different. Their discipline is different. And people don't know that. The title of your book, Taking Care, The Story of Nursing and Its Power to Change Our World. The title says so much. It is really bold. Titles are hard. And the book is delicious to read. It, it has a vocabulary and a 
rhythm and a pace and a storytelling with so many parts woven throughout it. I would love it if you could um, read a segment of it. Um, I think that the introduction is so powerful. I mean, the moment I read the introduction, I was, there was this relief because I think so many times when, when you're in a profession or there's something that's near and dear to your heart and you see that somebody's done another work on this, there's a little bit of trepidation, like, are they going to get it right? Uh, so I'd love for you to read um, a, a passage of that for us. Oh, thank you so much for saying that, Shauna. I would be happy to. So this is from Taking Care, the story of nursing and its power to change our world. And this is um, the end of the introduction. Nursing is, and always has been, both uncommonly complicated and uncommonly powerful. In considering nursing of the past and present, there are irreconcilable tensions in how nursing is defined, as a biological science and as hands-on caring, as professional and as domestic, as skills and as relationships, as knowing in the mind and knowing in the body. I think all of these can be true and that these complications are part of nursing's power. This book is a love letter to nursing's vast possibilities. I have been on the receiving end of nursing care so expert and compassionate that it altered my life. I know that this kind of care is possible and that it should be possible for all of us. So my purpose here is not to represent all of nursing, that would be impossible, but to argue for the inherent power of ethical nursing to recognize and address problems, to create a better and more just world, and to alleviate suffering. I want both nurses and non-nurses to understand that nurses have changed the world and continue to do so. The strengths of nursing, when traced from the past into the present, they have deep and urgent relevance to the problems confronting us right now. We are facing an escalating crisis of caring in many domains. Even problems outside the obvious realm of healthcare, climate change, policy leadership, the built environment, loss of community, have huge impacts on human health. Nurses see the symptoms of these problems written on their patients' bodies. As we face these interrelated crises, which all come back to the absolute urgency of caring for one another, all of us need to understand nursing's power to see and to act. Many of the nurses in this book are using their unique insight to tackle today's problems. We ignore their expertise at our own peril. What if we all recognized how false hierarchies have suppressed nursing knowledge, only making it harder for us to get the care we need? What if telling different stories about nursing changed the way our society valued nursing expertise? And what would it look like if more great nurses used their hard-won insights to lead, if they had the budgets, the authority, and the safety to do that work? A world like that might be a more caring, healthier place for everyone. Amen, sister. <laughs> you know, and the crowd goes wild with all the applause. Uh, when I hear you read those words, when I read those words on the page, it was this moment of joy of like, somebody gets it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you are seen, you are known, you are not underestimated, you are valued for the expertise that you bring. And um, I have been excitedly sharing this, talking about this is the book, this is the story, the history, the language of nursing that healthcare is needed. Um, it's a real frame changer and it's, it's such a gift to the world. Um, and it definitely, when you talk about it being a love letter to nurses, I, I know I felt that love and I'm sure as people around the world read it, they're going to feel that love as well. I think one of the things that I really appreciated about this is while it's it got the investigative journalist in you, you see that it's, there's so much evidence and so well supported there is the memoir piece, but there's this really rich storytelling and um, it's combining all of those things without having reading like through a history book where you have a timeline. So the organization of the book and the titles of these chapters, are, they're really thoughtful in the domains that you've um, framed and in those that framing, it really helps to broaden the understanding of nurses and nurses in the social and political context. Um, you know, it, it also captures the historical points, but the scientific progression, the domains where nurses actually have changed the world. Um, with this book being so heavily researched, um, and you mentioned um, you had to do, there was a lot of investigation you had to do, a lot of things that you didn't know. What did you unearth 
that you think readers are going to be most surprised to learn? I want to say one thing that I think the general public may be surprised to learn first, um, which is very specific, which is that um, the, the better the nurse to patient ratio so the, the more time your nurse has to spend with you in the hospital, the more likely you are to be discharged alive. <laughs> so I think that that in particular is um, something that the general public does not understand, that nurses are just as key, if not more key, to outcomes overall than anyone else in the healthcare team. Um, and so, you know, obviously we love physicians um, and people think of physicians as the people who are really acting upon them to create health. But that is only one small part of the story. And I really wanted the general public to understand that. I think that's something that nurses probably already know. Um, but that is something that um, I really want to hook the general public in with because um, it's critical. It's life and death and people don't know it. Um, and so that's one thing. But on a broader level, sort of thinking about both nurses and non-nurses, what would people be surprised to know? A lot of people, including nurses probably, think about nursing as a relatively recent invention, something that a profession that came about um, in relation to physicians and hospitals, that this is kind of like that nurses were needed by physicians, that nurses were needed in hospitals, and that's where the profession came from. In fact, that is backwards. Nursing actually came first. Nursing was the first kind of organized healthcare. It remains the most fundamental kind of healthcare. And you can see this when you look into history. So for instance, the first known school of nursing um, was established about 2000 years ago in ancient India. Um, and when I looked into the ancient Indi Indian um, system of healthcare, they, you know, there's a lot of one reason that this, you know, that this came up in the book is that there is a lot of documentation of ancient Indian healthcare, um, and ancient Indian texts portray or um, theorize healthcare as having four main pillars, and then pillars are the patient, the medicine, the nurse, and the physician. And it says without those four pillars of healthcare, healthcare doesn't exist. Healthcare can't stand. And so even way back when you see that um, this idea that nurses are equal partners in healthcare and that they are absolutely necessary and have very specific expertise, that's, that's a very old idea. That's not something that came about in the 1800s. That's, it comes from all over the world. So this idea that nursing has one origin story is absolutely false. Nursing has probably uncountable origin stories. And there is a richness there um, that I think is incredibly powerful for nurses to know about. Um, because once you understand that actually the drive to create organized skilled care um, within our societies is a fundamental human impulse, then, you know, then you understand yourself in that line of tremendous power that goes back to our earliest ancestors there was another story that I came across that I found incredibly powerful. And this was brought forth by an archeologist named Lorna, T Lorna Tilly, who also had worked in nursing. And um, she was on a dig. She found um, a young man who was, um, this was in, um, it was the dig was in what is now Vietnam. This was a Neolithic community that they were, that they were working on. They found a, young man who was born in the fetal position. And she realized that he had been born with a congenital disorder where his vertebrae became progressively fused. And he became, as a teenager, he became paralyzed and he probably couldn't chew and swallow easily. He couldn't move. Nevertheless, he lived for another 10 years. Well, how did he live for another 10 years in a Neolithic community? People nursed him. His community came together and they nursed him, either one person or multiple people, but his survival wouldn't have been possible without skilled care. And obviously that skilled care is very different than what we're talking about in terms of modern nursing. But what I think is so powerful about that is to say, actually our societies evolved. What makes us human is that we evolved to care for each other. But this is, you know, we don't have to be this like survival of the fittest, leave the week behind. That's actually not the full truth at all. I find that sort of those long seams of power running through all of human history 
Um, and culminating in these stories of nurses working today who are doing this amazing stuff, and you're going to hear from them in, you know, in, in, this, in this webinar, it was kind of overwhelming for me, honestly. I mean, the richness of those stories and my then, like, I get very excited to tell people about these things. So, you know, that's, I think that those, I think that those stories are surprising. They absolutely are. I mean, when I was reading through, and I, I feel like I've done a pretty good job of understanding um, our ancient history, as well as our modern and um, less modern history. But when I was reading through, I kept thinking, I, I was spent more time reading the re resources thinking, Sarah, where, where did you find all of this? You're not as a trained historian, but there are these elements that feel very much as I would read historical accounts, but then still the journalistic lens, the personal narrative woven through, and then the stories of modern day nurses, contemporary nurses, weaving all those things together, you do such a beautiful job of helping to see those threads throughout time, how they're woven together actually to create this beautiful tapestry of the, the story of nursing. And something that I ask quite a bit that I'm wondering, so much of the public's understanding comes from a very limited portrayal of what's in the media, what's in what's been written about nurses you know just very 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 narrow and you've absolutely you know exploded that thank you very much but i'm wondering um from your perspective what are the most harmful and limiting misperception and gaps that the public has about nursing um nursing in the nursing profession and i say harmful and limiting when we don't understand the full breadth and scope of nurses the public's really missing out so you know, if you had to prioritize, what do you think are the most harmful and the most limiting? Before I answer that question, I just want to go back really quick to what you said about sourcing, because I think it's really important for me to say that, of course, everything that's in this book is sourced from somewhere. Some of it is primary sources that I dug up, but a lot of it is from nursing historians who absolutely have been doing this work for um, decades. Um, and actually, um, Lavinia Dock and... Um, and um, and Alyssa Nutting wrote a giant history of nursing in 1907. Um, and so, and there are certainly current nursing historians whose work I drew on and you'll see them in the sources of the book. And I just want to say, of course, everything is a collective enterprise. Um, and, and I think sourcing and citing and giving credit is really important. Um, to go to your question, the public needs to understand that nursing is an independent scientific discipline. Nurses are not assistants to physicians. They don't, um, they do not simply exist in relation to physicians. They are a, um, a member of the healthcare team. And in fact, nurses provide the vast majority of healthcare here and all over the world. Um, so what I, what I really hope that the public understands is that if you don't have nurses at the table, we will miss nursing expertise in, in very specific ways. So for instance, I was thinking about um, the book is organized into domains and it's sort of domains of human life. So the people are listening when we talk about those domains, you've named them as origin, identity, community, addiction, environment, power. So it, it is these domains where, you know, the origin, the, I, the origin of, of nursing, the identity of nursing, um, the power. So I, I just, you know, as we're speaking about them, I just wanted to name them because they are, they're beautiful in and of themselves. I mean, you read through and there's this immediate scintillation of like, oh, this is a really new and interesting way to talk about um, care and nursing and their impact. Thank you. It took a long time to come to that. I started out with a sort of chronological um, approach, but then I realized that what I was really talking about was action. I was talking about how nurses notice things and then nurses make a plan and then nurses take action. And so the, the best way to tell those stories is in you know certain domains of human life. So for instance, um, thinking about the way that we die, you know, my experience with my mother was that um, it was very medicalized. She died in a, um, in a, um, like a rehabilitation center attached to a hospital. Um, but there is another way. And this other way is very much nurse led. And so um, one thing that I, you know, so just speaking from my own personal experience, my mother did not have what I would call a good death. When I did start doing some reporting with hospice nurses, I saw that actually there is 
a totally different way. And it is grounded in nursing knowledge and expertise, which is holistic. It's not focused on cure all the time. Of course, we all wish for a cure for what ails us, right? I mean, cures are wonderful, but sometimes there isn't a cure and we still need care, right? And so when we don't know about nurses expertise in these different domains, then we end up, um, you know, dying on a ventilator when it's, you know, when, when in fact you've had a terminal illness for years and years and years. I mean, that is not what anyone wants for themselves or their family members. Um, yeah, you know, when you, so- when you mention the, um, seeking cure, yes, we're, we're looking for, for cure in that process though, we always need care. And I, I think one of the most beautiful parts of end of life care is the ability to heal. And so yeah. While um, we all, we all, um, that is a part of life that it comes to an end, but it is the, the cycle of, of who else is there and that circle of concern, the people who love you. And so um, death can be a very healing process. Um, so I, you know, when it is, you know, we, we do look for cures. Um, there isn't a cure for death. Um, we will all have that. So how do we have that very good and, and dignified death? So I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up, the end of life model, the hospice model, that is so much, people don't understand that that really was a nurse led innovation. And then that's, as that's it right. became really successful and well adopted, um, it was taken over. Um, the, it, it was the medical establishment, our financial models said, oh, this is really working. Let's go ahead and, and put physician leadership in charge. And a lot of people don't realize that that model of care was um, a nursing innovation. So anyway, I I digress, but I just uh, wanted to pick up on that. I just want to say one thing about that, which is that the founder of Modern Hospice is thought of as a physician because she did go to medical school and she became a physician, but she was a nurse first. And the reason she went to medical school and became a physician was because she wanted to change the way that people died. And she realized she could only do that if she could prescribe medication and change medical culture from the inside. And so mm-hmm. even when we talk about how this came about, this was really a nursing insight. This came out of n- nursing knowledge. And it is most, I think it is naturally nurse-led. There is uh, such a rich, a rich history. And each one of these chapters in these domains go really, really, really deep into that history. Um, and again, starting out with the origins, the identity. So a really good grounding. And one of the places that you start and I think it's, it's really potent and top of mind right now is the role of nurses in the community and the, the many dimensions of the community. Uh, one of the incredible stories that you've shared about nurses in the community is um, with Toby Ash, who we have with us here today. So I'd love for Toby to, to join us. And um, Sarah, since you've done this interview and you've written this profile of Toby, I'd love for you to introduce her and set the context. Thank you. What an honor for me to introduce Toby Ash. I came across Toby's work um, through actually a neighbor who is a librarian who really wanted to tell me about this incredible group called the Emmis Initiative, um, who um, is it's a group of nurses who are reaching the Orthodox community in um, in Brooklyn and in sort of the wider New York City metro area. Um, so Toby is a, um, a nurse who specializes in women's and children's health. Um, she's also a writer and an educator. Um, and um, she has written a book called PI. And PI is, uh, stands for Parents Informed and Educated. And this is a book that Toby um, created and wrote to reach women, young women, young mothers in the, in the Orthodox Jewish community who had questions about vaccination. So um, Welcome, Toby. Um, Hello. I'm happy to have you here. We are, we are so, I'm so happy to see you. I am so happy to be with you here today as well. The placement of your story in taking care is so powerful because you are following along and building on the tradition of Lillian Wald and so much of the public health work that she was pioneering in um, public health public nursing, public, the school nursing movement, and um, the way the, this domain and chapter is set up, um, you really see the through line of what was taking place centuries ago in the communities, with families, in their homes, in their lives, in their communities, in their faiths, in their way of living. It's 
remarkable again um, how Sarah has written and captured this very clear. You see the line from a century ago to where we are today. So yeah, Sarah, keep keep going. I mean, I want you to talk about a little bit more about um, how you, uh, what you unearthed about Toby's work. So I was really lucky to be able to talk to Toby about her work um, in the Orthodox Jewish community in terms of the measles epidemic that happened um, several years ago. Um, Toby explained to me that, um, well, one thing I want to go back um, to an idea that, you know, people often say to me, nurses notice things. Nurses are the first ones to notice a problem, but you can't notice a problem if you're not tied into the community. You, you will not know what the problem is if you don't really know people. Um, and so I want to ask Toby, can you just talk a little bit about what you noticed, like what sort of um, caused your alarm at first, um, in terms of when you, when you, when you saw the rates of, of measles, um, happening in the Orthodox Jewish community here in New York a couple of years ago. I'm very interested in public health. It's funny that you mentioned Lillian Wald. Um, when I was a little girl, the first, my first idol was Jane Addams and Lillian Wald. So I guess I was primed since I was six years old to follow in their footsteps. I'm always interested in what's happening in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. As Sarah, as you know, I was, I was born into that community, but I split my time between New York and Florida. I've lived in Florida for a very long time. And so when I heard that there were uh, a few cases of measles, this alarmed me. It was right after the Jewish high holidays, the Jewish New Year, and I know that a lot of people travel to Israel or to Ukraine. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, new place that people are going to, to worship at that time. And I thought to myself, I, I knew I'd been following the statistics that there were high rates of, of measles in Ukraine. And I got worried and I got scared. And the reason I got so worried about it is because the ultra-Orthodox Jewish way of life is, is very family-centered everybody kind of lives with each other. They, they do things together constantly, and they're extremely mobile. For example, I live in Florida, but I travel to New York so frequently. So these types of things started to worry me. I thought to myself, wait a minute, what's going on? It wasn't just me. It was a concerted effort with a group of like-minded nurses. And we discovered that there was now a subset of very vaccine-hesitant families in these communities, we didn't know that they had been targeted by, um, I would say, very notorious anti-vaxxers. And this was frightening to me because um, just from the perspective of what a determinant of health, one of the loosely adapted determinants of health that, that I find fascinating to me is access. And by access, I mean education, and education in science and how, how our bodies work, which may be missing in some of these communities, and certainly literacy, which is why the book, and we can talk about that in just a moment, and also access to healthcare professionals and who you're choosing to go to. And then the next thing was, is that the social status, like how do they perceive themselves in the greater world? Everyone, each person has that. And how do you perceive yourself in your own world? And so, of course, income, poverty, how you navigate complex social situations, how you're going to get some basic things. So all of this was running through my head. And the last thing I was thinking about was the physical. But, of course, uh, children develop measles. And this outbreak almost caused the U.S. to lose its measles-free status, even though this was... Um, you know, this was thousands of cases. I mean, technically, there were about 1,200, a little over 1,200 cases, but that's what was reported. So this really, really motivated me and a group of people to do something about it. When you were looking at those case numbers, what did it tell you about vaccination in that community? It's so painful to me because uh, I feel so lucky and blessed to live in a world where I never had the measles. And nobody I knew had it. We didn't have polio. We didn't have any of these things. So I, I just, I was stunned for, for literally a day. I kept thinking to myself, why were these people targeted for this anti-vax, uh, by the anti-vax movement? 
And I realized it was because they didn't have health fluency and health literacy. And so part of the work is to give them the tools. If you don't know your options, you don't have any. And at that moment, they really didn't have education on how the immune system works and 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 how people lived just even 100 years prior, prior to the invention. Even polio, some of their parents had polio. And, and it just, it blew me away. So this was the impetus and the start of trying to just give people you know, accurate and reliable information in an easy to understand manner that they could access, because again, access is really important at any time and in a format that was geared to them with tremendous cultural sensitivity, because I grew up that way. So I knew what they wanted. At what point did you realize that knowing your community was the most key thing that you could um, do to build trust and help them to be educated and to help them navigate, um, like how did there's there's a, a passage in um, taking care talks about you approached with empathy. Um, I I know you. I care about you. What are your worries? I just thought that was such a beautiful framing. What are your worries? When I first started working in the hospital, very long time ago, because I don't want to tell you my age. So just imagine, it's decades ago. Even then, they asked on the employment questionnaire if you spoke a different language. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because in most hospitals, they really want you, uh, they want as many employees and staff members as possible to speak different languages to be able to interpret for patients who may have trouble. And that's the whole concept. At the most emotionally charged moments of your life, even if you have fluency in a second language, you really want like your mother tongue uh, to help you navigate very complex ideas and, as I said, like an emotionally charged situation. So what helps a lot in something that is as important as healthcare is to have a representative of the community, somebody that looks like you or talks like you or thinks like you or is from that place to build trust. Because at those times in your life, when an outsider comes to you, it it can be very um, threatening or off-putting. And you're just so much more comfortable with somebody that you know and somebody that, that you're close to and that, that you can have an easy rapport with. You don't have to explain certain things because they get you because they are you. And that, I think, helped enormously because they knew me they knew they trusted me. They, they felt that I wasn't going to lie to them and that everything that I was telling them was because I, I love them or, or even if I didn't know them well, that I meant them well. And just the general public, as they know more about nursing, how does it demystify um, the healthcare system and how does it uh, help uh, the general public to know that nurses are there to help them navigate their health systems? I think that when the public understands that nurses are there to know not just, you know, to know not just, you know, how your pancreas is functioning. Of course, this is all something that nurses do do biomedical work. But, you know, a nurse is not just there to, to tell you about this, this chemical pathway or to really um, to um, focus on just you holistically within your life, your family, your community, your values. Um, you know what are what's your living situation like? Um, do what kinds of things? As Toby is saying, what what do you have access to in terms and access? That's a huge. You know what what do we you know access to education? <laughs> access to water, which is an issue in this country. Um, you know all of those things are are about your health and your health cannot be divorced from that holistic way of looking at it, right? You cannot understand someone's health without understanding what their life is like. And so to me, what's so powerful about what Toby is describing is that she, you know, obviously comes at this with a tremendous amount of scientific understanding of how vaccines work, why they're important, you know, what happens with measles, um, why, um, why vaccination against measles and other illnesses, um, is, uh, is necessary, but she isn't just stopping there. She's understanding 
you know, what is the educational system like in this community? What kinds of messages are they getting from different um, kinds of um, people, prominent people in the community? Um, what are their worries? Um, and you yeah. cannot address someone's health without knowing those things. So one of the things in the, the organization of how you've written Taking Care, you again, start with this domain of community and community has so many different dimensions. When we think about, uh, when we say that, oftentimes I think people go immediately to geography, you know, that it's, it's, it's a zip code or it's a, um, an address when actually communities represent identities, abilities, stages of life, diagnoses, um, your interests, your circumstances. And so another really uh, beautiful way of demonstrating knowing your community, caring for your community, researching your community, is the story and the work of nurse researcher Roxana Chikas. She's a great example. And we're so thrilled that she's here. Roxana, welcome. And uh, I love since Sarah has interviewed you and knows your story for her to provide a little bit of an introduction and um, start with some of the different stories. Roxana, I'm so glad you're here. It's so good to see you. Um, and I was, I was very excited when I first heard about Roxana's work. I think I first read about her in the Atlanta Journal Constitution, that same idea of like understanding someone's health in a holistic way. And I was thinking about different environmental inputs. Um, and the ways that that um, impacts people's health. And I was thinking about climate change and the ways that um, increasing heat um, is impacting lots of communities. Um, and when I heard about Roxana's work with um, farm workers in Florida, that was incredibly, um, incredibly important that people know about this. So Roxana is um, an assistant professor at the Woodruff School of Nursing at Emory. Um, and she is also an investigator on some very extraordinary community-based research that she does in collaboration with the Farm Worker Association of Florida. Um, and I think that many of us sort of have on our radar this idea that um, when there are heat waves in the summer, sometimes you see headlines about farm workers collapsing from the heat. And these are really terrible stories. Um, and one of the reasons that that happens is because um, farm workers are often working in completely unregulated and exploitative working conditions where they are not even guaranteed access to water or rest or shade, which are things that they need um, to stay safe in the heat. Um, and so what Roxana is doing is she's working directly with the community of farm workers in Florida to find out how the heat is impacting their health. Um, and also to put tools directly into their hands that can help them stay safe. So Roxana, do you wanna um, speak a little bit about um, the different research that you have been doing with this community? First, I wanna thank you, Sarah, for highlighting the work that uh, we are doing and for writing this book. Uh, in the introduction, while you were reading the um, excerpt from your book, I started thinking, wow, I'm really am proud of being a nurse <laughs> because you just, it's so beautiful the way that you write about our profession. And I, I really hope that this book um, kind of pushes us forward as, as a profession, you know, to really find our voice and start influencing a lot of the things that are happening um, in our country and the world. And also for people to recognize, to have an awareness of how powerful the nursing profession can be. Um, but yes, so my research really is with um, agricultural workers looking to see how heat affects their health. And we do this with the Farm Workers Association of Florida, because I think that anytime you do community engaged work, um, the gold standard should be that you should partner with an organization who has built uh, a rapport with the, the community, has their trust, and also their best interests, who can, um, you know, direct us researchers in, you know, making sure that we, we are doing ethical research that's, you know, not burdensome to the community, and that it's, really meaningful to the community. And so, for example, when we, you know, were, uh, you know, thinking about doing research in Florida with agriculture workers, we thought that we were going to do research on pesticides. Um, and it turned out that the community was not interested in pesticides. And this was back like 12 years ago. They were interested in how heat was affecting their health because they were, you know, exposed to the heat. And they 
felt different. Like they, they could feel that the heat was increasing. And, you know, they said to us, it has to impact us. How is it impacting us? And, and, and so, you know, communities really know what's going on. And we as researchers should listen to the communities to find out what it is that they're worried about so that we can provide meaningful results, uh, findings from the research that we do. And so, um, and so that was 12 years ago and, and we're still, you know, researching what heat does, but we're also trying to balance um, finding ways to protect workers from heat related illness symptoms. So I, we feel that we can do both at the same time, right? We can investigate what's, what's happening, but also find ways to protect workers. And for my dissertation, one of the studies, uh, a pilot study that I did was looking to see, you know, could we cool workers down? Because our research had shown that workers were uh, going over the threshold of 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 um, Fahrenheit, which once you go over that threshold in medicine, it's considered a fever. And they reported very much the same symptoms that we have when we have a fever, right? So headache, nausea, vomiting, uh, body aches. So these workers were essentially working uh, with a fever, except they have no infection. And we all know that, you know, as core body temperature goes up, you can have heat exhaustion. It could lead to even heat stroke. And, and agricultural workers are the most vulnerable to um, heat stroke or heat related death, 35 times more likely than the general population. And so, um, so we tried, you know, these cooling bandanas and the cooling vests. We randomized them you know, to wear these devices. Um, and we wanted to see, you know, would workers wear them? Because these workers are, they have hard work. It's physically intense. And it, and many of them work for the, you know, are compensated by the piece. So it has to be something that's comfortable for them and it doesn't interrupt their wages. And it turned out that, you know, a, a cooling bandana, which is about $5 that they would put around their neck and they would uh, what as often as they want it, ring it out and put it around the neck, help them stay very cool. And what that tells me is that, you know, there are ways to protect workers. Um, this notion that that's just the way the environment is, this is just hard work, it's harsh work, and you have to accept it. It's not true. We can protect workers. There are ways to do it, and we need to find um you know, do studies to find those ways and hopefully to get growers to, to embrace, you know, methods to, to protect workers um, and also to influence policies. Like you said, there aren't any federal heat protection standards for outdoor workers. And with climate change and the frequency of, you know, the intensity of heat waves, it's becoming more and more of a problem. So, I'm hopeful that some of the research that we're doing will influence policy, will influence growers um, to, to really start uh, working together to, you know, stop workers from getting sick, to protect these workers. Because, I mean, these workers, all of us benefit from their labor every single day that we eat. And it's important that we start taking care of them. So I, I think, you know, nursing is not just, you know, at the bedside. There's a lot of things that nurses do outside of the bedside to, to protect um, different communities. I'm glad that you use that word community to, to um, some, you know, to, to, to really have a, a closing punctuation and an exclamation point on that, because you've done such a, um, you are a part of this community. And the reason you, there's a very clear and specific reason why um, the community of migrant farm workers trust you. Um, you know their lived experience. And I, I'd love for you to just say a little bit more about your own lived experience with you, your family, and um, why you know these, this, this life so, so well that you can be that trusted researcher. I'm from El Salvador. I immigrated to the United States when I was four years old with my mom um, through the southern border, very much how we see in the news. We were undocumented. I was undocumented until I was 18 years old. And then I, I got temporary protected status, which gave me the ability to have a social security number and uh, to be able to work. And uh, so I understand what it feels to be undocumented and to 
want to work um, and not really cause any trouble. You know, the the goal my mom would always tell me is was um, get a job, get a good job so that you always have a job and your boss always loves you. Right. And keeps you working. And so that was, you know, a lot of agricultural workers, that is their their goal. They want to be employed because they want to provide for their families. Um, and, and that's why they, they take on these very harsh jobs that are low uh, wages, because, you know, oftentimes that's the only thing that they have access to. And so I felt that, you know, I had had the opportunity to study here um, because of great mentors who kind of guided me into higher education. And I thought that it was important that I give back to my community, um, that I was giving like this platform where I could perhaps influence um, policy or how research is done. And I, 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 and, and I'm a nurse, right? So I, we could do as a nurse, a uh, researcher, you know, we can be out there in the community and do a lot of the biological uh, collection. We can also give health education and do science. And, and it's really important for us that when we go and do uh, data collection, that we, we not just take data with us and then, you know, analyze it. But we also really try to uh, put in other measures that the community is eager to have, such as, you know, measuring their cholesterol, their um, A1C, uh, their kidney function, their hydration status, um, because they're hungry for it, because they don't have access to health care like many of us do. And I totally understand that. Um, and while I'm, you know, in the community, you know, I talk to the workers, we talk and we share, you know, our experiences. They tell me how much they hope that their kids, uh, when they grow up, are, you know, go out, go on to, you know, college or university and have a career. And so, uh, you know, I understand all of, you know, our culture, how we eat, how, you know, what it feels like to be uh, an immigrant in this country. So, uh, you know, my mom is, uh, used to be a uh, work in the agricultural fields in El Salvador. And she could have easily, when she came to the United States, ended up being an agricultural worker as well. Um, she's ended up uh, being a domestic worker, uh, which, you know, has some similarities where there's no, you know, regulations in place for, for domestic workers. So, so um, there is that true connection with with the um, community and lived experience that I share with them. You represent this really beautiful intersection of community advocacy, research, um, health justice, social justice, and specifically the research being able to inform policy. And speaking of community, um, we might in some terms think of the planet as community. Uh, policy is care, nursing the system. And in, um, in the way, Sarah, that you've organized the book, you've got this really lovely chapter, Environment. And I love the subtitle, Seeing the Future, Nursing in a Swiftly Changing Climate. And I think about the multiple meanings of climate, um, the, the Earth's climate, um, our political climate. And in that, you've just done a really great job of um, opening the, that, that story up with the Hurricane Sandy and this mm -hmm. incredible story of hospitals having to evacuate our most vulnerable um, patients, the, the youngest, the smallest citizens, these little tiny babies, and just this um, incredible coordination and effort that was forced upon um, our, our healthcare systems and particularly nurses to be able to respond to this because of this rapidly changing environment. Um, incredible stories that you share there. And one of them is with Katie Huffling. Um, she's really nursing um, at the system level and helping us to understand why it's so important for nurses uh, to be policy experts and policy advocates. So we're so thrilled to have Katie here with us today and love to welcome Katie in. And um, since you've gotten to know her, Sarah, and, and told, you know, written about her story, why don't you go ahead and introduce her? It's wonderful. So happy to see you, Katie. Um, Katie Huffling um, is a certified nurse midwife, um, and she is the executive director of the Alliance of 
nurses for healthy environments. Um, and I was lucky enough to interview Katie for the book, um, as you said, and both Roxana and Katie are in um, the environment chapter. And I loved what you said, Sean, about nursing the system, because one of the things I did really want to make a point of was to describe how nursing can operate on so many different levels and the system does need to be nursed. So Katie described to me um, how she brings nurses um, to, to Washington, D.C. to speak with lawmakers about what they are seeing and noticing and then what they think the solution should be. So um, Katie, can you tell us just a little bit about um, what you what are the messages you're bringing to lawmakers? Um, what are the things that you really need lawmakers to hear from nurses right now in terms of in terms of planetary health? Thank you so much for um, having me be here with all of you today. It is such a privilege to be listening to these amazing nurses. And um, I'm just so proud to be a nurse. And I think nursing is just so special. And there are so many different ways that you can be a nurse. Like what professions can you take all of these different paths? Like it's just amazing. Um, and so as part of my job with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, um, we bring nurses to Capitol Hill very frequently. And nurses are just incredible messengers. Um, you know, as part of our nursing practice and as our training, we're taught how to take complex scientific information and break it down into really easy digestible pieces that the public can understand. And our elected officials are just the public, um, you know, and so we can take, I think, just an incredibly powerful mix of that, you know, taking that scientific information and then providing the stories of our patients and the things that we're seeing um, and our patients and our communities and having that personal story, um, it's just incredibly powerful as a pediatric nurse, for example, of taking care of children who are struggling to breathe um, because they're being exposed to air pollution that's caused by climate change and really making that connection on the ground. Um, you know, it, it, it's really hard to say no, I think, to that type of message also have to say that that one of the things that we've been really working on in the climate change space, because it can feel so overwhelming and so challenging, and, and there's so many different negative health impacts, is to kind of flip that messaging and really highlight the many health opportunities that we will realize if we take strong climate action now. We'll have fewer children with asthma attacks, more babies born at the right time, you know, not being born premature, um, fewer cardiac events, you know, there's so many positive health benefits. And so I think also raising up those positive things that we'll be seeing with strong climate action. When you think about um, what is needed on, on climate action, you know, the climate urgency, how do you think um, we need to respond in our practice um, you know, the, the idea that climate change is far off is just not true. Nurses are seeing it every single day. Um, all of healthcare system is seeing that every single day. But as we're responding to the um, environmental changes, the environmental disasters, you know, fires, floods, all, all manner of mayhem, what are some of the things, how is that changing our practice? Um, because so, so that we know that there are, we know that there are people who are vulnerable um, you gave a really great example in um, in your in in the in the book that Sarah captures about policy changes when we think about heat related events and how we're keeping our most vulnerable citizens, our older adults, how we're keeping them healthy. So, how does that change the practice and the policy? Yeah, so I think there's multiple ways that nurses can incorporate climate action into their practice. One is just the education that we do with patients. There's a lot of things that patients can do themselves to help reduce um, health impacts related to climate change. Um, for example, if you're taking care of pregnant patients, you know, what do they need to be doing on a high heat day um, or a poor air quality day um, to ensure that they're able to continue having a healthy pregnancy? Um, 
you can also be advocating for things like, you know, related to heat. If you have patients that are more vulnerable to heat, um, such as the very young or very old pregnant patients, um, can you get insurance or Medicare, Medicaid to pay for air conditioners in their homes? And then also the electricity needed to run them. So really, you know, thinking of different ways that um, we can be shifting policy and payments. Uh, but then we also need nurses being leaders within their healthcare institutions. This is a huge problem. And healthcare is part of that problem. We're one of the largest greenhouse gas emitters of an industry um, out there. And so we really need to be looking at the energy that we're using, the materials that we're using, our healthcare waste, and you know, as the largest portion of the healthcare workforce, if nurses aren't the leaders at the table making these decisions and changes, it's just not going to happen as effectively as it needs to. You mentioned particularly the most vulnerable, that the health risks and these adverse events, that, that that's who's going to see it first. That's going to be the last to recover. Uh, in 2019, the Lancet countdown report on health and climate change, they warned, and I'm going to read this quote, a business as usual trajectory will result in a fundamentally altered world where the life of every child born today will be profoundly affected by climate change. Without accelerated intervention, this new era will come to define the health of people at every stage of their lives. And to provide some insight on that and perspective, the risk to birthing people, pregnancy, infants, I want to turn to public health nurse, Sherry Wilson. Um, Sherry, you have um, a vast amount of experience in public health. You have a vast experience, particularly in maternal and newborn, um, looking at it from, the, from a population perspective. You got, what, what, do you, what were you seeing and what are you recommending as far as thinking about nurses, nurse, uh, nursing our system and thinking about planetary environmental health as far as how that's related to our human health? Absolutely. Shauna, thank you um, so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on this panel. We do know that according to the CDC, um, the uh, maternal and infant mortality statistics, generally speaking, um, Black women are um, three to four times more likely to die um, for pregnancy-related childbirth complications and um, Black babies are um, uh, almost four times as likely to die as well uh, due to preterm preterm birth. What are your thoughts as far as how we're going to protect Black women, Black babies? Well, one of the things that um, is at the top of my mind is our um, future nursing workforce. So um, all of the, the years that I have worked in public health and, and maternal child health has helped inform the work that I do today in advancing the next generation of um, nurses and, and healthcare prof professions, uh, professionals. Um, I work for an organization um, who would that was founded to uh, make sure that students of all um, backgrounds, whether it's geographic or socioeconomic backgrounds, have access to high quality care and in high quality education. And in that role, um, I uh, started an online health sciences career pathway um, that has touched um, thousands of um, middle school and high schoolers across the country and abroad who are interested in becoming nurses and healthcare professions. And this work was informed by, um, of course, the global nursing shortage crisis, um, gl global health inequity trends um, as it relates to income and wealth, um, race and ethnicity, um, gender, urbanization, globalization, and ultimately my lived experience as an African-American woman um, growing up in the most densely populated state in the United States, New Jersey. And having to navigate those educational um, and healthcare uh, systemic barriers um, throughout those zip codes really helped to inform um, this pathway for young people. And so um, 
looking at the Future of Nursing 2020-2030 report, um, this report calls for really cultivating our future nursing workforce um, from a diversity perspective in order to promote you know, health equity. And it calls for it, um, really um, advancing and, um, and redesigning our educational system. So it really starts, I'm, I'm, I am approaching it, if you will, from the front end at a student's um, in, the, in their formative educational um, years. And I believe that's very important as we talk about having a more culturally competent and diverse workforce is really starting as early as possible in terms of um, those careers um, and um, education and promoting career identity. So um, it's attracting um, a more diverse workforce. And I believe that's important when we look at um, you know, when we look 20, 30, 40 years from now, from a generational perspective, um, you know, I think starting um, in college or, you know, it's a little, it's a little late. It's really oh, it's so late. It's, I mean, you're being, you're being very gentle and polite. Sherry, yeah. I want to get you some fire in there. Like, <laughs> I, I just, no, I mean, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's really interesting because we talk about climate, you know, and there's the climate you know, the air that we feel, the, the, the temperature, all, but there's also the political climate. There's also the social climate. Um, our data, our evidence, research, experience, qualitative, you know, quantitative, all of that points to when people who live like you, look like you, speak like you, eat like you, pray like you, care for you, it gets better. It gets so much better. And all the work that you're doing, I mean, it translates from your experience as a clinician, then really thinking about it in a public health perspective, taking care of different communities and translating to say the climate on all these dimensions is going to get a whole lot better when we have a workforce that looks like the communities that we're caring for. Um, so yeah, I, I just want to invite you to have a little bit more fire about this. <laughs> I, just, I also want to name, build on what Sherry is saying and, and name something, because when we talk about disparities, I think it's really important to name what what the what we understand about the cause of the disparity is because it can give an impression that there's something wrong with certain communities when that is not at all true and is not supported by the research. In fact, the research really, really strongly suggests over the course of um, several decades now that it's exposure to racism that is the cause of um, the higher maternal mortality rate um, for Black women and for um, the um, increased prevalence of premature birth and unfortunately infant mortality for Black communities. Um, so when we're talking about this, I always want to make sure to name that because um, it has an impact on how people understand the problem and your work, right? And so when you're talking about um, increasing the diversity of the workforce, because that promotes health equity, um, I think that's, I think it's really important to point out that that's because, you know, we, we have a problem with racism in our, in our medical system. Absolutely. Um, and that's, and that's where much, this is what research suggests that this is where much of this problem is coming from. And it's obviously multifactorial, but I just want to name that. I also wanted to hear from you, Sherry, like, what do you hear from the, you were describing working with, um, you know, middle schoolers, like, what do you hear from middle schoolers about what they, what they think about nursing? It's very interesting. Um, when I came into this work, um, it was um, at the height of the pandemic. And um, in my mind, I was, I was thinking, I said, you know, this must scare future nurses or, <laughs> you know, um, students who are thinking about becoming nurses. And to my um, surprise, I was just so happy to see, uh, you know, that we just had, there's still so many um, young people out there that, that want to become nurses. Um, and they're asking for, how do, how do I do this? What are, and, you know, what are some ways that I can come into the profession listening to Toby um, talk about access. That's what separates us. You know, it's not it's not ability. It's access to um, to to resources. And so this is what they're they were asking for, and it helped to inform you know the work that that I do um, with these uh, health science pathways. 
this has just been such a, a, a wonderful conversation where we've looked at community, the dimensions um, of community, how important it is to have nurses to navigate through um, the community expands far beyond the zip codes that we live in and the people that we know who live like us to this very large community, um, the earth, the planet, the environment that we all share. And then going back to thinking about um, the most vulnerable people and how nurses are really key in taking care of the least, the last and the lost. And when we center on them and we've got people who are coming into the profession and who are committing their work and their research and evidence to the profession, how we truly all get healthier. So I wanted to bring everybody back in and just get some, some closing thoughts here. Um, you know, I, Sarah, one of the things that you write about so beautifully is that there's, there's a crisis of care. Oftentimes I hear the framing that there's a nursing shortage or that there are vacancies, but going back to some of your really important insight is that um, when nurses aren't there, people die, lives are lost. And it's, it's not just the physical nurses because it's the nursing care, it is nursing. And even if we have an, um, nurses in the right place, are they given work environments? Do we have models that allow the care to be where people need it, when they need it, in the manner in which they need it? Going back to what Toby was talking about as far as access and the same thing that Roxana mentioned about access, um, that so many people don't have it. And particularly Katie mentioning how important it is for those who are, who have, who, who are forming the policy, who have purse, who have power, who have privilege, for them to really understand the impact that, nursing and, that nurses and nursing have on our ability to improve lives, to um, change our world and, and improve it, make it for better. So just real quickly for, for nurses who are in this book, how does it feel to be written about, to have your career written about in such an important book? I thought, I wonder why she's so interested in me <laughs> when she contacted me um, and kind of reading it uh, or, or, you know, hearing Sarah speak about my work. I'm like, oh, I, that is pretty cool what I do. <laughs> um, so I'm very flattered. And I think it's so great that Sarah is so uh, interested in our profession and, and really kind of raising awareness of all that the nursing profession is and how um, we can bring a culture of, of health to everyone um, and, and that we're powerful. And I certainly feel quite powerful uh, being around all these amazing nurses. Anybody else have a thought about uh, what it feels like to have your work written about so beautifully? Uh, I'll tell you what, what was like that blew me away is for most people, they think health happens like at the clinic, you know, that's where health begins. But as, as all of these fantastic nurses said, health really begins with, you know, quality water and quality air, like making sure that they're safe. It, it's the little brake light at the top of the car so that the car doesn't hit you. It's tiny little things that make up your whole life that give you health. And if we can meet people, even at those little levels, like making sure that workers who have to work outside to pick our vegetables to make us healthy, have a $5 cooling wrap. And if we can do those little things that improve other determinants of health, then what ends up happening is our little community, then our city, our neighborhood, our world is much healthier. And we all have the power to do it until 2018, I didn't know that even just writing about things or talking about things would have such a profound difference. And it did. So thank you, Sarah, for writing about us and for allowing us to bring little bits of health to the world to make a huge difference. Sarah, what do you think the take home is of taking care? I think that the message of the book in some sense transcends the nursing profession, or I hope that it can transcend the nursing profession to ask everybody, um, what care do we owe each other? You know, what kind of a society do we want to live in? What does understanding more about nursing ask us 
about policy. And, um, you know, when, when we think about that Neolithic boy who was absolutely kept alive by his community, that that's who we are, that's how we can be. So what does that mean for us? It has policy implications, it has implications for everyone's daily life. If, if my neighbor is healthy, I'll be healthy. If my city is healthy, I'll be healthy. If all of those things happen, then maybe my daughter can have a, have a healthy future. You know, I just, um, I think that it's a virtuous cycle. And I think that thinking about and understanding what nurses do specifically in your profession, in your independent scientific discipline can also call the rest of us to think about our societies differently and make different choices that will be healthier for everyone in the long term. And I guess that's what I really, that's, that's what I really hope for this book. That's a big, that's a tall order. Oh, it's, it's a necessary order. I mean, when you think about at the time that we're at right now with health systems and citizens around the world, experiencing the consequences of not having enough nursing care and what we're seeing as far as surveys and data and actions with nurses leaving, um, then <laughs> it, it needs, the, the, this book is needed at this moment. So um, Sherry, I wanted to direct this last question to you. Um, you have been um, acknowledged and honored as somebody who has been thinking about the future and focus on growing our workforce. What do you think the impact that this book is gonna have on individual nurses who are practicing um, who are thinking that maybe they need to um, cease that or they're questioning their choice. And in particular, those um, people who are considering and um, uh, planning to become nurses. I think this book um, is and will continue to be very inspirational for the future of nursing. Um, you highlighted a just a few um, of the women here uh, on this panel and, and their work. And it, it just goes to show you, you know, look at what we can do, look at what we can accomplish. Um, and our, our work, our actions, you know, will, will reach generations. It will impact generations. And so, um, so I'll leave you with that. And Katie, um, working at the policy level, thinking about the biggest patient that we have, planet, the environment, um, what do you think the impact that taking care, the story of nursing can have on health, populations, citizens, plants, animals? You know, I think as we saw with the global pandemic, you know, our current medical system isn't working and the way that we provide care is not uh, is not working for most people. And this book really highlights how the nursing model of care with our focus on holistic medicine prevention, we have the opportunity to totally transform care as we know it, but also the health of our patients, communities, our practice. The nursing model is so powerful. And I hope as more of the public um, learn about the power of nursing, that we can start to work together to lead the change that is going to be necessary for the survival of our planet. When I'm in this conversation, when I think about the, the body of work and the people, the lives, um, the nurses who have delivered care, the lives that they've touched, I feel such strong emotion and gratitude. And, um, I, I wanted to actually end our discussion today. Sarah, I forgot to mention this to you. Um, so if you've got the book, I would love for you to read from the introduction again. I think it would be a, a really beautiful way to bring this to um, a close for this session and an invitation for more people to dive in to these beautiful words and stories and this language that you've bathed us in. So if you could... Um, start from there and just and read that section. And I think that we will all sit here and um, feel um, a great sense of reverence and appreciation as you do. First, I just wanna say like the work of a journalist is 
is to is like the luckiest work of all, which is to write about real life. And so all I've done here is write about the work that you all do. Um, so it's really not about me. It's about the work that people are doing. That's why I love what I do is that you can find the most amazing things in the world to write about. I mean, there's so much, there's so much, um, I, I just find so much inspiration in what you all do. And that's what it's really about. Um, there is a, this is maybe a bit of a tangent, but there's a Salman Rushdie quote um, from the ground beneath her feet. And it's, and it goes, the world will break your heart, but it will never fail to give forth wonders. What is required of you is your attention. And so to me, like my work is about paying attention to what you're doing because it's it's a wonder. Um, and it's also true that the world is probably breaking all of our hearts a little bit right now or a lot of it. Okay, um, so this is from Taking Care of the Story of Nursing and Its Power to Change Our World. Um, Sooner or later, we all need to be nursed. A nurse may have been at your birth and may be at your death. Sometimes nurses are the first and last people to touch us. Nursing is a profession, an independent scientific discipline, a practice, and a way of interacting with the world. It's also an elemental public role, one that elicits deep feelings, beliefs, and anxieties in the collective imagination. I came to this meditation on nursing as a journalist, but also as someone who grew up surrounded by the illnesses of the people I loved most. Because I'm not a nurse myself, my perspective has limitations, but I would argue that nursing matters to everyone. It draws much of its power and effectiveness from the relationship between nurse and patient. It is the indispensable foundation of all healthcare. And so in that sense, nursing belongs to everyone. When I was lost in the wilds of the American healthcare system, nurses showed me and my family how to move forward. Nurses are not just there at the most profound moments in people's lives. They use their knowledge and skills to guide people through those moments. Well, with that, um, I am so grateful for my colleagues. I'm so proud of them, who they are. I'm grateful for this book. And um, May being National Nurses Month, it's, it's this moment to reflect and to appreciate, but it's also a call to action. And what I'm so grateful for is the opportunity that this book has to shift and shape the better um, more accurate, more helpful narrative of nursing and nurses' power to change the world. So again, with that, thank you all. And um, I, I can't wait to share this book with the rest of the world. So thank you again. 